and yes, uh, hopefully you'll be able you. to stick around. Um, let's move on to our next speaker, Dr. Susie Demeester. Susie was a graduate of our emergency medicine program in 2006, and uh, she's been back in Michigan, I think, ever since then. Um, Susie gradually developed a, a niche in emergency cardiology, and she's been back to to speak at our cardiology symposium, I guess, uh, last year or the year before, but uh, very recently. And uh, recently, I don't know if this is some new niche of yours, Susie, but I, I saw her give a little presentation on the MRAP live stream, maybe last week or the week before, on some dermatologic manifestations of COVID. So I don't know how emergency cardiology and derm seem to fit together there, but uh, anyway, it was a great presentation. Um, and so uh, I was hoping that she'd be able to present that talk on some of the derm manifestations of COVID for all of us. So Susie, welcome back. Well, thank you for that um, introduction, Amal, and thanks for having me. Um, I had to start um, looking for maybe a secondary niche just because we're not seeing STEMIs anymore. So I um, <laughs> got, got interested in this, and I was really amused to discover and horrified that I am the most geriatric presenter here. So um, shout out to class of 2006. And uh, here's the Princess Bride introduction. Um, and I've always thought of, for me, it's been aortic dissection and maybe for you guys in Baltimore, it's syphilis, but these are the great masqueraders in EM until COVID. And so like Wesley here, um, COVID has shown us that it's presenting in disguise, which brings me to the topic of my lecture, COVID toes and other skin manifestations associated with COVID-19. And so as Amal mentioned, I did speak about this uh, about two weeks ago on EMRAP, which in, feels like two years ago. Um, and by now, I think most people know about COVID toes. It's been, you know, in the New York Times and in the lay press. And so while I'm going to review COVID toes and pernio, I do want to start, um, I do want to talk about some other cutaneous manifestations associated with COVID that you may not already know about. And so this is kind of the theme, the mantra of my talk is that skin is the manifestation of systemic disease. And I think this is an important message for all rashes that we see in the ED. Uh, and maybe for all of life, because we have to remind ourselves not only to focus on what we see on the outside, but also what is within. And that's pretty deep for a derm talk, I think. So, but it's true. Um, we see hives, right? We know to consider anaphylaxis. We see shingles, and we know that's a reactivation of varicella zoster. And with COVID, it's the same thing. So what we're seeing is really vascular and hematologic dysfunction. And so why are we only hearing about this now? Um, COVID emerged months ago in China, and they reported only 0.2% of skin involvement in their patient population. Um, but now, based on the Ital Italian experience, based on what we see, have seen in Spain and now the U.S., we're seeing up to 20% of patients with some type of skin involvement. So that's 20, one-fifth of your patients are going to have some type of cutaneous manifestation. And there could be many reasons. I think part of it um, is due to the fact that China was obviously very overwhelmed with this novel virus, and they probably focused on the more life-threatening um, pulmonary and systemic manifestations. And then in Italy and Spain, we know there were a lot of um, primary care physicians and even dermatologists on their front lines. And so I think they started making these observations. And now we have telehealth. Um, and so U.S. dermatologists are reporting record numbers of cases of pernio. Um, they are reporting that their cases are surpassing what they've ever seen previously in their uh, careers. So in addition to the COVID toes, there are a lot of nonspecific rashes associated with COVID. Uh, and I'm going to talk about those. Um, and then there are specific rashes associated with vascular dysfunction, which are libido reticularis, acrocinosis, the pernio, and then most recently, the Kawasaki. So pathology. So there are two different camps. One is this idea that, you know, COVID is a virus and we're very used to seeing viral exanthems. And so there's an autoimmune or a hypersensitive type reaction. 
And then the other group are these rashes that are representative of vascular dysfunction because we know COVID is pro-inflammatory and pro-thrombotic. And again, skin is the manifestation of what we're seeing inside of the body. So lots of rashes up here. Um, because COVID, as I mentioned earlier, is a great masquerader. So there's maculopapular eruptions now documented, vesicular lesions, and urticaria. I'm going to throw up a lot of photos because I think for me, at least, that's how I learn dermatology. It's this pattern recognition. And they're mostly sourced from a recently published um, Spanish atlas that was put out to help educate and teach the world. So maculopapular rashes is a big family. And um, here we see a patient with documented COVID who presented with a pityriasis-like rash. So that herald patch and the Christmas tree distribution. We can also see a morbilliform rash, which just means it's like macul maculopapular rash that coalesces and you have very little normal skin showing through. And then axillary purpura. Um, lots of cases of documented axillary purpura. And I think for me going forward, if I see this in the ED, I'm really going to be thinking COVID because it's a very unusual distribution, um, as is Palmer erythema. So we see this, but we don't usually see it in adults. So I think I could easily see this in the ED being a chief complaint, right? Palmer erythema or the axillary purpura. And then even erythema multiforme. Because just a quick review, erythema multiforme forme is usually triggered by a virus or another infection or maybe a medication. It's usually self-limited, sometimes can reoccur, and it's characterized by these coalescing macules and papules that eventually go on to form these rather large kind of targetoid-like lesions that you see in the center picture. Vesicular lesions. This has been now widely documented. This was even documented in the um, literature coming from China. So I think, when I think vesicular, I think shingles. Um, but when dermatologists think vesicular, uh, they capture a lot of other conditions like my perifollicular lesions, things that look almost like folliculitis. So just kind of broaden what you, you typically think of um, to be included in this family. Um, vesicular also makes me think shingles. And with COVID though, what we're seeing is we're seeing these lesions, they're crossing dermatomes, they're occurring bilaterally, and so they're not following the usual rules that we expect with uh, uh, shingles. So again, these are um, in the family vesicular lesions, but they look almost like folliculitis. And after looking at, you know, a hundred of these pictures, they definitely kind of have the same pattern. Um, and so that's why I'm trying to just show you as many of these as I um, can. And then again, this one looks to me more like folliculitis, but, but it's considered to be in that vesicular family. Same here. And then this last one, this looks like more of a true vesicular type lesion, but it's not following a dermatomal pattern. And again, it can cross the midline. And then it's not really that surprising to see urticaria on this list because the most common causes of urticaria are going to be viral or allergen related. The treatment when you suspect a relationship to COVID is going to be the same. So it's really just going to be symptomatic therapy. So very classic urticaria can usually occur on the trunk, on the back. Um, I had a patient now a month ago whose chief complaint was urticaria had no triggers, and then kind of fast forwarding on his review systems, he ended up really having symptoms consistent with COVID as well, and went on to be diagnosed as COVID positive, even though his initial chief complaint was just this rash. So I've talked about these maculopapular lesions and these nonspecific lesions, these vesicular lesions, well, let's go on to talk about rashes that are more specifically associated with COVID um, because of that underlying theme of vascular dysfunction. Um, it's very important to keep in mind that these can all be normal variants. So there's people with these conditions chronically. So you really should inquire about chronicity 
um, if you see something like this in the emergency department. So levito reticularis, huge differential here. So this can be a normal variant, usually uh, cold is a trigger, but things like drugs, autoimmune conditions, infections like coronaviruses or malignancy are all associated with levito reticularis. Uh, levito reticularis has this very classic shape uh, and is thought to be related to maybe vasospasm when we're talking about autoimmune conditions. Uh, but with COVID, the causation theory is probably uh, that it's related to microemboli or microthrombi. And what we see is a macular, so a flat, purplish, reticular, net like lacy rash. So this is very classic, it's usually symmetric. Um, it can be kind of everywhere on the body. Often it can be on the abdomen or on the extremities. But of course, COVID likes to throw cur curve balls. And now there's been case reports of rather well-appearing patients who have unilateral and even transient libido reticularis. Acrocinosis, it's in the same family as libido reticularis. Um, again, can be, it's a pretty common normal condition or chronic condition. Um, the thought is that it's due to vasospasm. And what we see is symmetric, bluish, persistent discoloration that occurs in the hands or feet. And then lastly, lentos or pernio. So this has been clearly now associated with COVID and it's being uh, seen in all stages of illness. So we're seeing it in a prodrome phase, we're seeing it during active infection, and then especially we're seeing it in this convalescent phase because pernio actually can last for many weeks. It doesn't go away very quickly. And um, we're also seeing it particu in particular in adolescents and young adults, and this is not usually a pediatric exanthem. Uh, you know, dermatologists are getting as I mentioned before, many, many telehealth visits with pernio COVID toes as the chief complaint. The real question, at least for dermatologists, and probably for us, just so we can understand COVID better, is whether these lesions are true pernio, or are they more like pernio-like lesions? And the difference is that true pernio on uh, pathology is just going to have inflammatory changes without any type of thrombi in the little microvenules, whereas perineal-like lesions are going to have microthrombi and microischemia. And the case reports are just starting to come out and they're actually showing both. Um, so they're showing true perineo and other patients are demonstrating perineal-like lesions. And so this is probably, this may be either two separate diseases or could be on different ends of a spectrum of one process. So that is still to be determined. Um, what you're going to see, you're going to see erythematous, violaceous papules, distal fingers, so this happens on the fingers as well, toes and heels, and patients are going to tell you it's very uncomfortable, it's pruritic often, and burning. And this is a nice example of the swelling that's often associated with perneo. And if you look really closely, sometimes you can see micropatechiae. So again, can happen on fingers and on toes and on heels as well. This, uh, these pictures are from a patient um, here in Ann Arbor, which is where I've practiced. And um, it was sent to me by my friend who's a local dermatologist and saw this patient via telehealth. Uh, he consented for the pictures to be released. 17 year old, no history, had no other complaints. This is why he was calling in. And uh, luckily she did a full review of systems, got some past history, and he had reported a cough and severe myalgias a month earlier as, as had his mother. Um, and he did not undergo formal testing, um, but was diagnosed presumptively with likely COVID in, um, now in the convalescent phase. So how do you treat this if you see a patient in the ED? Well, topical high potency steroids, so that's gonna be like clobetazole um, for symptom, symptom control. And then I'm not gonna get into Kawasaki because that's been covered, but I don't think I realized that three of the five criteria for Kawasaki involve dermatologic findings. So we see a polymorphous rash, you can see the cracked 
lips um, or mucous membranes with the strawberry tongue. And then again, palmar erythema usually associated with some swelling of the hands or the feet. All right, so your patient has COVID toes or has some other dermatologic manifestation and you're now worried about COVID. What do you do? Well, identification of one of these rashes, why I'm showing you all these pictures, obviously has major implications when we're talking about diagnosis, notification, and quarantine of symptomatic or otherwise asymptomatic individuals. I really think if it's available to you, a rash like this should prompt testing. And ideally, I think long-term, it would be really nice to be able to um, do antibody testing as many of these patients seem to be in the convalescent phase. So right now there's no clear guidelines. Um, locally, we have now added skin manifestations to our testing criteria. Hmm. And so we're testing patients with these types of exanthems. So key points, if you see a new rash, think COVID. Pityriasis could always be pityriasis, but it also, I think for the near future, or maybe for the next year or two, could be COVID. And then with specific, there's specific rashes that are associated with COVID because of vascular dysfunction. And these are levito reticularis, acrocinosis, pernio, and then probably Kawasaki. And then always remember, skin is the manifestation of systemic disease. All right. Thanks, Susie. Thanks for putting some Princess Bride references in there also. So um, I think we have time for a question, if there's any, anybody who has a question out there. Okay. If there's any questions, please unmute and ask. Now, there's a, a couple of people that reported anecdotally having some patients with COVID who had rashes. And so this is something that we're starting to learn more about. I just have a, if there aren't any other questions, I just have a quick question is, um, with this COVID rash, is, can this be an isolated finding in the absence of fever and cough and everything else it's just showing up with the rash? Definitely and can be an isolated finding. So uh, based on this, um, well, all the literature I've read as well as the, this dermatology it's a, of cases that occurred outpatient via telehealth as well as inpatient as well as ICU, um, patients can present only with cutaneous uh, involvement. Um, it can be a prodrome. It can also occur while the patients um, are having other systemic manifestations, um, but especially with the pernia, we're seeing it often in the convalescent phase, and we're also seeing it in adolescents and young adults who are reporting no other symptoms during an entire course. And are they automatically getting started on anticoagulation? So I think early on, actually, when I spoke on EMRAP so two weeks ago, it seemed that many dermatologists were considering to start these patients on aspirin. Um, but like I mentioned, the histopathology is not always showing that microthrombi are occurring in this true pernio cases, and there's really no indication for anticoagulation at that point. So I think the dermatologists right now are starting these patients on, um, just based on the skin lesions, just symptomatic therapy, um, which would be a topical uh, high potency steroid like clobetazole. In um, cases of true pernio prior to COVID though, when it's very severe in patients, especially with lupus, they're put on immune modulators and even Plaquenil. So I, find, I found that really interesting, but currently I think uh, topical and symptomatic relief is what, um, what dermatologists are doing until there's some formal guidelines. All right. Well, great. Thanks, Susie. That was fantastic.